to the other Underground Railroad. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Nichols, and today we are discussing uh, one of the more difficult topics. I can't say that I'm not even a little bit nervous to talk about it. Um, it's something that I think has gotten a lot of people in trouble, and you know, I, I've even been told you need to have a script or you need <laughs> to be very careful, particularly in academia, talking about it. And I've actually been warned by a few people not even to address it because of the fact that it is such a sensitive subject. But I feel like the fact that we don't address it is one of the big problems. And, and I don't know how far this conversation is going to go. I don't know, you know how many people are actually going to see it or listen to it. Um, but I do think it's important to have. And so I brought somebody on that I know, I've known you know, damn near all my life and I trust. And um, someone who I think is invested in the community, particularly, uh, you know, the Baltimore area and the Baltimore City community. Someone who I think has done uh, incredible things um, for the people of Baltimore. Uh, he, I think he's probably too modest to say it, but, you know, to being a business owner and employer and what he brings, uh, you know, to the community. And, of course, I have to say, it's a restaurant, Hershey's Pizza and Drinks. It's a, <laughs> the food is incredible. Um, and, you know, they employ people who have been incarcerated. They, you know, they have a social con conscience. They were one of the first restaurants in Baltimore to really take the social distancing issue seriously. Um, so uh, without further ado, I am introducing my friend, Josh Hershkovitz. How you doing, Josh? I'm doing great. After that introduction, you make me sound like somebody I want to meet and hang out with. I... <laughs> well, I want to hang out with you more. So definitely, once we can get rid of, you know, uh, COVID and, and all the people who have made COVID worse, you know, uh, I definitely want to hang out with you because you are a person that's worthy of being, is it hung out with or hanged out with? I don't know. <laughs> it's always I don't know. A... Um. But so first, I guess I want to start, you know, by talking a little bit about the, the things that kind of precipitated this conversation. First, with um, the issue with Deshaun Jackson, that was, you know, maybe two weeks ago or so. Um, and I had it pulled up here, but I wanted to know what your reaction was when you first heard um, you know, or you first read about what Deshaun Jackson uh, had posted on Instagram. You know, my mind goes racing in a lot of different directions on that because, you know, you have that initial response. And like you said, also, you know, it's hard. It's a, a topic you're, you know, often pushed away from even addressing, you know, um, I am Jewish. Um, but I don't see everything through that lens. Like I read this and like, oh, no, this is, you know, this is like meant at me. But... I mean, it's unfortunate. I feel like we're at a place right now where there's a reckoning on certain things and we're not even close to what needs to happen right now in this country, but at least people are talking about certain things. And I feel like every time there's a spike driven between, you know, this, it's, it's just, uh, um, it, it becomes unfortunate, you know, and then immediately, you know, what you hear back from him is, oh, everybody knows I don't hate anybody. And that just makes me laugh, not in a good way, but I feel like if everybody knows you don't hate anybody, you're not the person who needs to say that. Like you obviously put yourself in a position where people think you hate people. Right. Um, but but angry, but honestly more, more sad than anything else. Yeah, I was a little embarrassed that he believed this was an authentic quote. <laughs> you know, right, sure, yeah. I think that like uh, the grammar, which is totally off. I'm like... You know, subject verb agreement there. I feel like Hitler was a little better with that, but at the same time, um, you know, it is it is problematic when you start quoting Hitler uh, sure. at any point for anything. Um, and I think that you know, one of the places that this conversation is going to go is into a difficult position, and that is to discuss Farrakhan, which you know, honestly, is one of the parts that scares me because. I reject certain parts of what Farrakhan says, but I also reject the comparison of him and, say, a David Duke. I right. think that there's, there's a whole lot of nuance there that people miss out on. And 
I think where a lot of African Americans get a visceral response, and I think Jews that I've known, Jewish people that I've known, get a response, you know, kind of the opposite way, is that Jewish people will say, if someone said this or did this, you know, about African Americans, you know, they would lose their job. And African Americans say the exact opposite. Right. They say, you know, you can't say anything, you know, without, you know, being, for example, with Nick Cannon losing, right. you know, every, you know, his his entire brand and everything based on one comment. And people are like, Farrakhan, and I think this this is valid, Farrakhan, there is not one that I can think of. One Jewish death that can be attributed to the nation of Islam or Farrakhan. You can attribute a whole lot to the right wing crazies. And that's what I think a lot of African Americans get frustrated with is that we become the face of anti-Semitism when the people who walk into synagogues and shoot people up are, are never black. Right. They're never the black people, you know? And you know, I, I will be the first to admit that there is absolutely anti-Semitism in African-American communities. And I have witnessed it with my own eyes and my own ears. I've heard things that make me really uncomfortable. And I've spoken up in those situations and been called an Uncle Tom and, you know, the whole litany of stuff, you know, um, has been thrown at me because, you know, as you know, um, I grew up in an environment where there were, um, Jews were more represented than they are nationwide. Sure, well. sure. You know, so I remember you guys said it was like you and, and um, Jill, who I actually wanted to come on tonight. Um, you and Jill had said that it was 10% 10 10 of McDonough was, was Jewish at the time. I think so, yeah, something like that, yeah. When we were there. Um, but the, the influence I felt like was bigger because it felt it felt like more. Um, but still, 10% uh, when Jews are, what, 2% of the population? Right, much smaller percentage of the country, sure, yeah. Yeah, so it, it felt like a much larger, um, a much larger population. And I can tell you, you know, uh, my dad grew up in post-World War II Germany, um, you know, 10, 10 or 15 years removed from World War II. And so my family, when they were in Germany, non-military, um, when they were in Germany, you know, bonded with Jewish people. You know what I mean? The, the, the few Jews that remained, it was like we, they were the only black people and there were a few Jews and they were the only Jewish people. Um, and my grandmother, one of the cutest things in the world, uh, my uncle went all the way my, for my grandmother's 90th birthday, went all the way to Germany and filmed her best friend from Germany, who's like yeah. 97. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they were speaking. And so... You know, uh, I have an affection for for Jewish people. Um, and, you know, my dad's wedding, there were, of the groomsmen, there were five of them. Two were my uncles, one was me, and the other two were two Jewish guys, you know, who were my dad's best friends. Right. And, and I hate having to say I have a Jewish friend, you know, but, but you know, sometimes you, you have to preface things that way, so... I, I really feel strongly about anti-Semitism. But I also think that there's like something that oftentimes gets missed in a lot of these conversations, particularly when we start talking about anti-Semitism and Farrakhan. I, I wrote an article in the, in the and it, it was flawed, I will say that, but I wrote an article in the Baltimore Sun about Israel and not getting black support. And one of the things that I thought happened um, and by the way, you can, anyone who's listening or watching this can probably see that I've been anticipating this conversation. I like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I know you're the person who's supposed to be getting interviewed, but like, I'm like bursting with so much that I want to say. Um, it's just, 
you know, this, this idea of making black people the face of anti-Semitism. And that was the whole point that a lot of people who commented on the article, you know, blacks are anti-Semitic. They are the main anti-Semites, you know, and that's frustrating to African Americans when we're like, where is the history of, for example, violence perpetrated by black people against Jewish people? It's, if not, I won't say non-existent, but it is small in comparison to others. And that's what's frustrating. I think it, you know, it's interesting. It comes from two very different places, I feel like, this sort of white supremacist and people marching down the street and Jews will not replace us. And look, I, I will shoot a Jew if I can, you know, like that, like that sort of attitude, um, walking into the synagogue in Pittsburgh, walking into the synagogue in San Diego, was it, you know, um, you know, I think it comes from a different place, a, a place of hatred that, you know, and, you know, just the way you're nervous to address certain things. I feel like when I say things that I think I'm not trying to say that I speak for people, I can get inside their heads and say exactly what a group of people think. But I feel like, you know, what Nick Cannon says, I feel like what Deshaun Jackson says, I feel like, you know, African-American anti-Semitism comes from a different place. It is not from a place of these people will not replace us. This is a white country and we need to protect it from these people for all intents and purposes have all white privilege, but they're still Jews. You know, um, I think it comes from a, a, a very different place. Um, you know, part of that place is, you know, uh, um, you know, there is a shared history to a certain extent in this country, right? Like, you know, there was lots of shared neighborhoods or a lot of shared experiences, um, you know, and as people are starting to reckon, I think in this country now with, uh, a lot of people have for a long time, but but some people are starting to understand what, what white privilege is. You know, uh, people yell back at me, well, I never benefited from, I'm like, anything you're going to tell me right now in this country would have been harder for you if your skin was not white. Like, I know it's hard for you to understand that, but that's how it is. Um, so people are starting to wake up to that to an extent. Uh, you know, I think... Uh, um, yeah, these are, you know, like I said, I'm not, I'm not the most qualified person to speak on all this, but in my head, there's sort of a, instead of an intersectionality with Jewish people, I feel like there's like a, a, a sort of a, a negative one or an opposite one. You know, you, you are a marginalized group as a religion for whatever, for however long, but then you also take that and you have white privilege, you know, you can ascend to different places because you're not seen as this as that right out of the gate. You're not decided against right away because somebody can see you walk out your house and say, I mean, some people can say that, but that's a Jewish person right there. But, you know, this acceptance and this ability to be white, I feel like is part of what causes ire by some people towards, you know, like, so these, I'm trying to think back in January, right after the, uh, the, the I think that was when the, mm -hmm. there was the uh, shooting in Brooklyn, you know, we had uh, that flare up in Brooklyn with the, uh, the Jewish uh, supermarket. And it happened to be in Africa. That was an African-American man. You were talking about violence, but you can point to one case, right? Like there's one thing you can try and find. Um, you know, I read this uh, essay. It's a James Baldwin essay about that, you know, uh, African anti-Semitism is not, they're anti-Semitic because they're anti-white um, Jewish people. And he goes on to just talk about how, you know, in his neighborhood growing up, all these people that were, you know, above him, the grocer was Jewish, the uh, uh, the butcher was Jewish, and he hated all these people. He hated how they took his father's money, they gave him the worst treatment, they, you know, all these things that developed this sort of hatred. Um, but part of it was also that here's a group that is marginalized, and then they get to be accepted as white, and somebody will say right back, and I'm rambling, like, no, like no. on and on. But, Not at all. <laughs> I think this is great. But somebody, you know... Uh, um, somebody will try and rationalize a Jewish person will say to a, to an African American person that, no, we suffered too. And, you know, the, the big difference is like, yes, you can say that to an extent, but you get accepted here. Like you have a different experience here because you can recede into these positions and you can make up 50% of the Supreme court. And it's not considered a black court. You can make up 50%, you know? So I think there's, there's two different sides that this sort of, you know, uh, um, it's not even hatred on both sides. There's two different sides that these sort of viewpoints are coming from. There's hatred on the one side for the people that come in and shoot up a place. And I think there's almost 
hurt on the other side. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I was going. I kind of lost it towards the end of that. But uh, No, no, I, I think you're right. And, and you're bringing up that James Baldwin essay is a really good point. Um, I think that so and it's and it's interesting how this works and there's no place more that this i think applies than baltimore where you had jews who were discriminated against uh and were not able to really you know uh participate in a certain level of whiteness which relegated them oftentimes to opening businesses and things in black neighborhoods and, and around black people. Um, and then, you know, black people felt exploited or mistreated. And the anti-blackness, just because Jews were, uh, were discriminated against, didn't mean that they always had empathy for black people or sympathy for black people. No, no. Um, and you and I, and, and look, you know, I don't, I don't want to call out names, but you and I, grew up and knew people who were very anti-black and were Jewish. You know, some were in positions of power, some were our peers. Um, so this idea that there's automatic empathy, I do think, as I've said many times, I believe that, you know, one thing that I see a lot of Jewish people do is they throw out the involvement in the civil rights movement, and which is fact. You know, um, Jews were absolutely involved in, this, in the civil rights movement. But again, that involvement is understated by African-Americans, but over-romanticized by Jews. You know, I, I think yeah. there, there, it existed. There's no question about it. But it's understated by African-Americans. I think African-Americans oftentimes forget about it. And I think it's over-romanticized, you know, by, you know, many people and when it's used, it's oftentimes used in a way that's bored, that's pretty much racist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, forget all that mistreatment. We were there for you in the civil rights movement. Um, and it's the same people that tell you you should get over segregation tell you, hey, I helped you get over segregation. Right. Um, and I think, you know, there, there's no question... You know, I think about Baltimore, and this is a case that I oftentimes, you know, think about, is there was a point, and you may remember this, when we were really young in, in, in Baltimore, uh, there was a whole lot of violence in one of the projects, or maybe it was a few of the projects, maybe it was, I think it was Flag House, or one, one of Murphy Homes, something like that. And so the city contracted the Nation of Islam to do security. And this was in the height of the crack era. And violence dropped to nothing. Like it was like overnight. We're right now, we're talking about the police. The police are all happy saying we dropped, you know, crime. I don't know if you saw that article today in Baltimore in the Baltimore Sun. They're saying crime is down, even though murders are exactly the same. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, there was a quarantine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No one was out on the street. School shootings no are down. Nobody's in school. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, it's hard to rob people when they're not outside of their houses. Uh, hard to, hard to, you know, pull an armed robbery in a business when the business There's isn't open. There. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, they say that it was trending that way before then. But violence, you know, Baltimore has always been a relatively, at least as long as I can remember, a pretty violent city. Yeah. And the Nation of Islam doing security un unarmed, uh, at least you know, <laughs> unarmed security, um, just had walkie talkies. And part of it, I think, was because people had so much respect for Malcolm, had so much respect for the nation, that people would be like, oh, yo, here comes brother so-and-so. And a lot of these people were from the community. So they were like, yo, here comes brother so-and-so. Let's just put this in our pocket and walk around the corner. You know what I mean? Right. So the violence, the competition, all of that was kind of going down. And it was Jewish people who essentially said, you can't do this. You can't pay these people with tax dollars. 
you know, when old ladies were finally safer to walk down the street. And they were like, you can't do this. And some of these, some of the pressure came from outside the city, too. You know, um, and so they rescinded the contract and then violence went right back to where it was. Um, so I think certain people in African-American communities resent that kind of those those stories and those situations. Um, and, it, and it causes it leaves a door open for certain feelings of anti-Semitism to grow. See, I think I think Baltimore is a great example to bring up, though, because I think we can go back even a little bit further with that. When you talk about going to neighborhoods and people feel exploited, people open up businesses, you know, a big difference, you know, in these neighborhoods that were black and Jewish for a long time, you had a group living there who was not able to build wealth and generational wealth and do anything different. And you had a group who lived there who was able to pass money on to their family and not having crippling redlining, you know, uh, practices against them so can move out of this area. And like, look, we were here together and you are privileged in this way here. And this is my lot just because this is who I am, here, you know? So, I mean, and I think it goes even further back than that here. There is, you know, a, a lot of clashing because of that, not because there's hate because of that. It's just, I'm the one child and I was treated this way and I'm the other child and I got the, sh you know, yeah. I was not treated this way. Um, yeah. And I want to be clear, Bill. I'm not making an excuse for anti-Semitism. Um, I'm just telling, you know, trying to provide context for why it exists, why one, one historically oppressed people have issues with another historically oppressed people. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to justify it. I will say that this is one of the reasons why people have a multifaceted view of Farrakhan. Um, and... I'll also say that a lot of the quotes that are attributed, because I remember this in high school, I don't know if you remember, there was an assembly or like there was a meeting about black people and Jews and we all got into a room and it was turned into a shouting match. It was crazy. Um, but one of the things that came out of that was that a lot of the quotes that are attributed to Farrakhan are, actually weren't stated by Farrakhan. They uh -huh. were actually stated by a guy named Khalid Abdul Muhammad. Yeah, I remember him, yeah who was in the nation and eventually was expelled from the nation. And, you know, so I think a lot of that is a misunderstanding in terms of not saying that Farrakhan hasn't said things. I'm just saying, you know, there's also people, uh, why African-Americans will defend Farrakhan is because people throw quotes at you and it's like, he didn't say that. Another man said that and you're attributing it to him. Um, to me, yeah. you know, yeah, sorry, go on, go on, yeah. Oh, no, I, I, you know, I think there's one other thing that I would say in terms of, you know, what Nick Cannon said and what Deshaun Jackson said, and there's a big groundswell of black people who, African Americans, who say we are the real Jews. Right. And, and I want to just explain that to, you know, anybody who's watching this, why that exists. There's also a groundswell of African Americans who say we're the real Native Americans. You know what I mean? Like, like slave ships didn't exist. That's all a myth. We've always been here. And I want for anybody who's watching this, particularly if you're not African American, and particularly if you're Jewish, I want you to understand where that comes from. Being an African American is literally like being an adopted child. You are always searching an adopted child. And I would even say not even an adopted child. I would say because that, uh, you know, when you get adopted, generally, that means a family cares about you. You're brought in, you're loved. Yeah, yeah. I would say more like a foster child. So you are always thirsty for who you are and where you come from. The home you are in, you are not made to feel welcome and it doesn't even feel like a permanent home because you are made to feel like, you know, you're just living there. You're not of that home. You're not like the natural born children. <clears throat> so there are a couple of things that happen in your imagination. And one of the things that happened to black people 
was the Bible was used against them as a way to enslave them. One of the beautiful things was once black people could actually read the Bible, even before they could read the Bible, they started to see, wait, there is a parallel between, you know, my story and my history and the Israelites of the Bible. And eventually you keep seeing pictures and representations of the Jews in the Bible, including Jesus. <clears throat> And he looks like the person who's oppressing you. In order to break free from that, many people said, no, he looks like me. And no, I am those people. You know what I mean? Not my, my story is analogous. Not even I'm God's new chosen people. It's more I am those people because you're right. always right. looking for your roots because your roots were literally cut off. You literally don't know who you are. You can point back to Africa, but I, you know, tell me what ethnicity, African ethnicity, my family comes from. I have no idea. My mother's side, I can't trace past her father. You know what I mean? I know her father, who her father was, and that's it. I don't know any of her cousins, uncles, none of that. You know what I mean? Uh, my mother's mother's side, I know all my, you know, my cousins, but I don't know her parents, or anything like that. I'm sure you can probably trace your family back generations and generations. And I'm envious. And I think most black people are envious. African Americans are envious of that. And when you look at people in Jamaica or in Trinidad or in Colombia or Venezuela, at least they can attach themselves to a nation state. America has never accepted black people where we could fully say, I feel like I'm an American. So with that sensation, you're constantly, you know, and, and I hope my sister doesn't get upset with me and I'm going to get real deep here. But, you know, my sister and I have different fathers and she didn't, you know, know her father for a long time um, and know who he was. So what did she do? She imagined things in her head. You know what I mean? And she imagined who he was, what he looked like, you know, all these kinds of things. And it was all based on what she thought was great, you know. And so I think with black people, we're essentially doing that same sort of thing where, you know, when you've been cut off from your roots and there is a clear history that's, that you can see and it's godly it's attached to god it's attached to that level of greatness when your school books are telling you africa was a bunch of hunters and gatherers and not only are you were your ancestors enslaved here in the u.s they were probably enslaved in africa you know that's a hard thing for people to grasp and to to internalize you know and so that adopted child syndrome makes people say, no, I'm, a, I'm really a Native American. No, right. Right. I'm really a child of Israel. I'm the real Israelite, you know what I mean? And so I think that's where it comes from. And, you know, of course I want to believe, of, you know, I don't need to be that. I, my ancestors were great, but I don't have the information. Right. And that's something that just like, you know, if you're an adopted child and you don't know your birth parents or you are a foster child and you don't know your birth parents, you know, you might imagine that Josh Hershkovitz is your dad because he's the restaurant guy. And, you know, don't, don't tell him, don't tell him. <laughs> he's a successful, you know, businessman. And you're like, well, maybe that's my dad. You know what I mean? Or you see somebody on TV and he's successful and you're like, maybe that's really my dad, you know? But imagine for African-American people, you look in the Bible and you're like, maybe that's my dad. Maybe you know, I, don't even, I don't even think that the comments that, that were made, that those are the ones that I think people have problems with as much as the disparaging remarks that followed about who the Jews actually are in that story. If we're the actual Israelites, you know, uh, the Jews are the people who tried to deceive us for this long to let us think that we were not those people. 
Um, so there's a disparaging part that I fully get what you're saying up to that point. But then there's the part that, uh, you know, uh, um, they were forced to be from the Nikan and things. Something I, don't, I, I, I listened to it, uh, the interview, but I was trying to pick out pieces that seemed the juiciest, uh, you know, uh, um, about who the, uh, you know, like these people were savages, you know, and they had to, uh, they had to deceive us to make us think that we are not these original people. And um, even so, I'm not taking issue with that. I mean, uh, however we feel about it, I feel like that's what people have more issue with other than, you know, that we're the real Israelites. Uh, um, because that can, people can argue over that. People can say like, oh, that just sounds delusional. Or that sounds like, I don't know that, you know, I think it's the part of the, 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 the disparaging remarks that follow it, you know. Yeah, I think, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, definitely Nick Cannon, his whole thing of people going into the mountains of caucus. And, you know, I mean, I'm not necessarily, first of all, it, it the, re the only reason that I'm, I'm not, I know that I'm going to get, oh, this dude is Uncle Tom, he's this, that, but I'm not making fun of that way of thinking. And the reason I'm not is because, um, you know, I used to, in this classist way, you know, talk about, you know, the books that you buy, you know, you can buy with incense at the mall kiosk or something like that. Yeah. But I realized now, brother really schooled me and said, you know, that's a gateway to consciousness. A lot of people find their way from those books to France Fanon or to the stuff that I read. You know what I'm saying? So... I, I never want to disparage that. Of course, I've had issues with things like, you know, Tariq Nasheed and, and you know, the guy who, who made Hidden Colors. I disagree with it because I think, you know, it's a mixture of truth. There's a lot of truth in it, but there's a lot of falsehoods and mistakes. And as someone who is in part by training a historian, you know, that that frustrates me when I'm right. looking at something like that. That's not true. You know, that's patently false. Um, but I understand why it's valuable. And I understand why, you know, uh, people, when you don't have a history, you create a history. And I, and I remember actually, you know, that's something that's done with LGBT history because so many people were in the closet at one point you know, they don't have the, the strong history outside of, you know, a couple of things like the Harlem Renaissance and other things. You know, they don't have that strong history. So what do they do? They invent it, right. you know, um, in some cases. And I'm not against that. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I think that I understand what happens there. Um, but it's equally dangerous when it turns into anti-Semitism. Um, but at the same time, when I think about like the dangers, the frustrating thing is all of the commentary from the Twitterverse and from the Facebook universe is, you know, that Nick Cannon is dangerous or, you know, Deshaun Jackson is dangerous. My thing is the people who are the ultimate immediate threat to Jews are not the Nick Cannons of the world. No, it's the people that the, that the president is sending dog whistles to, you know? <laughs> it's the tiki torch folks. They, they are the, the pressing danger. And the other thing is when you equate, I think some people took issue whenever I post about this. I think I posted a short thing that anti-Semitism exists in black communities and anti-black racism exists in Jewish communities. Right. We both need to work that out. That was it. That was all I posted and got heavily criticized. And the point being that people on thought- both, I, On both points, right? What's that? Yeah, criticized heavily on both points, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that the, the Black people were saying, why are you equating anti-Semitism with anti-Black racism? And I think their point, which I think has a lot of validity, is show me the Jewish George Floyd. You know what I mean? Show me the Jewish Breonna Taylor. You know, show me where somebody said, you know, like they did to Christian Cooper, I'm going to call the cops on you and tell them a Jewish guy is harassing me in the park. Right, right. But I bet you that there are a couple of Jewish Amy Coopers 
You know what I mean? So sure. that's their point. And I think it's 100% valid. And one of the things is anti-Black racism is systemic. And I'm not so sure, and maybe and you can correct me, I'm totally open if I'm missing something, if I have a blind spot. That's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, whether we did it in this forum or if we just did it over the phone, just us privately, is I don't know that anti-Semitism is systemic in that way. You know, It's not in this country. I feel like you know, when it goes across borders, you know, and all over the world, it's not as systemic in general. But there are a lot of groups out there with their theories about how they put this plan into place and they get rid of the Jews and this and that. But when you look at it in this country, no, it is, it is not the same thing. And that goes back to what I was saying about, you know, who could, you know, buy their way out of certain neighborhoods and who couldn't. There's a right. It's not uh, systemic in the same way. A hundred percent. Um but it's something I wanted to go back to. You mentioned before, it's like, you know, uh, bringing up Farrakhan and then, you know, he's not like, you know, like David Duke, you mentioned on the other side. And I agree with you. They are, they are not, they are not the same thing. David Duke, for whatever he thinks white powers or whatnot, he's not doing anything to try and help people that he takes as his people and tries to find a way to lift people up in any way. I feel like that's a big difference between the way he is and who he motivates to do acts of hate and who Farrakhan is. Right. Having said that, even if it's not, you know, like quotes that are not actually Farrakhan's quotes, every time he opens his mouth and says something close to that, he draws a divide between himself and somebody else trying to be inclusive and actually solve something. And, and, and I think, you know, no matter how I feel like, and even the example you gave about, you know, uh, um, in Baltimore providing security, I feel like anything good that might happen, I am not going to get behind this man if I'm following somebody who's talking about this is, I know about homosexual people and this is who they are. I know about Jews and this is who they are. I'm not going to, despite the good, it's going to be hard for people to get on that line behind somebody like that. So I fully understand the difference, you know, between those two men. It's just, you know, it, it's, it, it's hard to swallow wherever it's coming from. No, I, I, I totally understand. And I, I understand when, you know, it, it feels particularly for a group of people that are, as we said, you know, maybe 2% of the population, maybe less, you know, a small group of people. Um, and then, you know, people re recite the same things that, you know, the Tiki Torch people might say, like the Jews control the world, the Jews control banking, the Jews control the media. Um, and, you know, I can tell you, number one, in, in the media that I'm in, you know, Jewish people, just anecdotally, Jewish people aren't controlling that. Those aren't Jewish people, you know what I mean? Um, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail, but those aren't Jewish people. Um, but, you know, this whole idea that, you know, there's this Jewish plot um, to keep everybody down, you know, that's, that is dangerous. That's a dangerous thing to discuss. That's right. a dangerous thing to talk about. Um, and the idea that you're not a real Jew, um, I guess the argument is, you know, what is a real Jew then? You know what I mean? And I've always kind of had that question. I guess that's a question. Is like, you know, is, is Judaism an ethnicity or simply a religion? Because if it's a religion, then I should be able to join. You know what I mean? I should be able to. And it is something you can join. I mean, it, you know, it is a religion. It is something you can join. But just like any movement, any sort of, and they don't have a lot of movements akin to religions, you know? So, but, you know, it becomes a culture, right? You have practices and you live together as a people for however long. So do I go to synagogue, uh, you know, and, and worship in the way that people, I, I don't really, I still identify heavily as Jewish. That's how I was raised. That's, you know, you know, talking about knowing who your ancestors were and what your history is. I know the traditions those people did. And, you know, there's things that I cherish about it that I pass on to my kids. Um, but, but, but. I mean, anybody can do it, but it, it is it is a little bizarre that it's a birthright thing, right? If your mother is, just your mother has to be, and that, that you know, there, there you go. Um, 
I don't know, people go back and forth on that, but you know, it's funny for something that's a tiny either religion or a tiny culture somewhere, all the, you know, hate or just not even the hate, like, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of memes you see online that uh, uh, it's never a good thing when a Jewish person reads a, a meme or a headline in the, uh, in the paper that refers to the Jews. Like, it's never brought up in a good thing. Hey, the Jews had a great day today. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I dig that. And I think some of this, too, um, I think there's a big discussion and the reason, I mean, I, I understand that I can certainly convert to Judaism, but could I convert to Judaism? And like you said, with the birthright, could I move to Israel, you know, and, and claim, you know, Israeli citizenship or should I, or can I, you know, claim asylum in Israel? You know what I mean? That, like you said. It's really political. You would have had to convert it with the right rabbi you know you would have had to have uh, you know this kind of if you weren't born of a jewish mother you had to uh have to jump through the right hoops for sure honestly uh in israel even you know people two jewish people getting married to each other if it's not the you know the right rabbi or not like and it's changing definitely there now but it's not considered a a, a jewish marriage wow. um so it's uh um yeah no i i don't i mean i know also you're talking about acceptance too right and uh um you know, it, it's but just like anybody, right? People say, like, don't tell me who the Jews are. Don't tell me who black people are. We're not a monolithic, you know, like we're all the same person. That's not the way it is. And, you know, for every group I know that feels like, yes, you can convert, but uh, you're kind of on the outside. You're not really, you know, it wasn't the right rabbi. You don't practice the right way. You don't look like me. There's also like the synagogue that we belong to is a very big um Tikkun Olam mission, which, you know, it, 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 it you know, means to heal the world. Like, there's very much, like, what can we do to go out to make the world a better place? Because some people take the mandate of being chosen people as we're chosen and we're better and we're hold our heads up. Other people, and this is just the way I identify with more, are chosen. Like, if, if you believe in a deity of something and the deity, you know, serves to love the people they created and make the world a better place, if you, I don't, I don't feel like I'm chosen, but I'm saying, you know, like, the, the mission is, I mean, I was chosen by you to come on today. But besides that, um, you know, the mission is, you know, <laughs> the mission is to make things better, right? To work on making things better, make the planet better, whatever that, what it is that means to you. So, you know, we can talk about who's accepted and who's not, but it's it's not a monolithic, you know, uh, group of thoughts, really. Um, I think that's the, right. Yeah. Oh, I was done, yeah. No, I, I think that that's an incredible way of looking at it, is that being chosen is a responsibility um, rather than just a privilege. And I think right. that, that, you know, I've never heard it stated that way, to be honest with you. So I think that that's incredible. And, and honestly, when we think about, you know, the, the prophets that all the three monotheistic religions believe in, you know... They were chosen, but they were chosen to serve and to bring certain things to humanity. Right. And eventually, and, it, and it's so interesting that people who worship these three religions hate each other so much. I'll never get it. Like, you know, when, you know, the differences between Judaism and Islam or Judaism and Christianity in, in many ways are minuscule. Maybe they're practiced differently, but I won't say like, you know, the scripture is pretty much the same. Or um, even within Christianity, all the wars between the Protestants and the Catholics for, uh, you know, like it gets even more micro. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's crazy how human beings look to divide ourselves or distinguish ourselves or make ourselves seem more worthy than someone else. Um, it just, to me, it's frustrating because when I look at Jewish people, and African-American people, we have a common enemy, a common exploiter, a common, you know, uh, uh, person that holds us back. And I'm not saying the whites you know, or anything like that, but I, what I am saying is that, you know, those Tiki Torch guys and the people who sit there and tweet about Black Lives Matter and saying they're terrorists, uh, and also, they also tweet about George Soros and him being some sort of devil 
puppet master. Um, I mean, there's Jews who tweet that too, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, it, it's it's all these anti-Semitic tropes that are tied in with anti-Black racism, but yet Jews and African Americans can't get it together. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't. That's the thing that's kind of frustrating um, for me, and I think part of this also you know, is one of the hardest parts about the conversation. And I have to be very careful how I state this. But part of it is Israel. Yeah. Um, and the debate about Israel. And I will say this, and I've said it publicly, I haven't lost my job yet. <laughs> you know? But so if you see me as a bus boy at Hershey's Pizza and Drinks, <laughs> you'll know... <laughs> Uh, that I said probably something I should not have said. But I think that there is a difference between being anti-Semitic and having critiques for Israel. Now, I do want to explain that a little bit because there's somebody who is going to watch this who is going to be, you know, taking note and getting, and they're getting hot right now. The face is getting all, all red right now when I said that. First of all, I believe Israel has the right to exist in the way that all nation states have the right to exist. You know what I mean? I, like, I don't think that there's a nation state that I would go around saying it doesn't have the right to exist. And people who say Israel doesn't have the right to exist, I'd be like, give me five other nation states that don't have the right to exist. Now, if you want to say France doesn't have the right to exist, you know, uh, Spain doesn't have the right to exist because they've oppressed people. If you want to say England doesn't have the right to exist, right, right. you know, hey, all right, at least you're being consistent. But if you're putting all of the focus on Israel, you know, that's where I think people start getting worried about it being anti-Semitic. Because why Israel as opposed to many other states that oppress and harm people? Now, at the same time, I think I should be free and open to criticize any nation state without people believing that I hate the people in it. <laughs> you know, that makes 100%, sense. yeah. Sense. I'm talking about the government and I'm talking about structures. You can, just like I criticize the United States government, doesn't mean that if some invaders from Mars come in and start trying to, you know, first take over the United States, like that I won't freaking go out and bleed and die for this country. You know what I mean? As effed up as it is, you know, as much as it oppressed my ancestors and all of that, you know, this is, this is, well, I would bleed for the land and I would bleed for my neighbors anyway. I don't know the government, but you know, certainly bleed for my neighbors, bleed for the land, and that would even be, you know, my white neighbors, my black neighbors, of course, my black neighbors, but my white neighbors, my Jewish neighbors, my Muslim neighbors, my Catholic neighbors, you know, um, even though I disagree with them on many things. I still, I love the American people, but I criticize America as a, you know, as a white supremacist structure all the time. And I feel like I have the right to do that. And I can criticize white supremacy globally. And therefore, I also think I can criticize Israel for what it does wrong. I think that the parallelism there, you know, and, and you said, like, you know, nobody needs to say it doesn't have the right to exist. And the part where it gets, you know, you know, just edgy there is people say that. And why are you calling out that one country that just happens to be the one Jewish country as well? Like, there's so many countries that say this is the religion, like the, you know, but it's the same thing. If you say that in this country, how many times, you know, when you go on TV, are you met with comments online like "love it or leave it, get the hell out," right? You know, no. But that's the that's the same, you know, with, with Israel too. If you criticize the structure there, and I'm not talking about, then you get called anti-Semitic. It's also like, I even mean, by my own family, I get called anti-Israel when I, you know, criticize like things need to happen there. Things need to change in a drastic way. Right. Um, I don't say anything about. Um, the state doesn't have the right to exist, but you're always met with like, you know, it's so funny. There's so many ways that everybody wants to pat themselves on the back and say, this is the best country ever. We can do anything we want. 
All these things are possible. Hey, let's change this about this country. Whoa, we can't go that far, you know, or we don't have the money for that. You know, we're right. the greatest country ever until it comes to becoming the greatest country ever. Then we can't do it. You know, it, it's a similar sort of thing there. So people have all this pride and whatnot. This great place, this great open country, you know, uh, it's the only place in, in the Middle East where you can have a gay pride parade and whatnot. You know what? There's a group of people whose necks we have our feet on, you know, like they cannot breathe, the people living in God. Oh, no, we can't change that. We can be the best country over here. We can't do anything about that. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. And, you know, even though I'm an African-American, I, I feel like, I, I, not even even though, I want to say because I'm an African-American, I feel like it is my duty to call out injustice. Now, I do think the focus on Israel obscures so many other injustices that happen around the world. And yeah. it frustrates me. You know, even, you know, some of my Muslim friends, I'm like, listen, Habibi, you know what I mean? Like, you got to understand here, like, there are people in freaking concentration camps in China. Yeah. yeah. There are people, you know, in other parts of the world who are doing who are Muslims who are being oppressed, you know, but your focus on this one part of the world sometimes obscures the pain of Muslims in other parts of the world. And I think that's what frustrates me a lot. I, and don't get me wrong, I have tons of empathy for the Palestinian people. Um, I just, and, and tons of criticism for the Jewish state as it exists today. Not saying that I don't believe a Jewish state should exist. And there are these people out there, you know, one guy that we went to high school with, I won't mention his name, but he sends me an email every now and again. He's seen me on TV and he's, you know, and he'll be the first one. The funny thing about it, he's the first one that says, you know, hey, if black people don't like it here. They can leave. You know what I mean? As if. My ancestors literally didn't build the infrastructure of this country. I was going to say, we're leaving, but we're taking all the cities we built with us. <laughs> right. You know? Um, yeah. So, uh, and so the, the, the idea that I can't have a critique of Israel, Israel or that if you are, and I wouldn't even go as far as to say anti-Israel as much as I am anti any state, you know what I mean, any nation state. If you look at France and what they've done to people all over the world, particularly black people in Africa, and you know, before they got their asses kicked in Haiti, like the stuff that they did was deplorable and the stuff that they're still doing, you know, if you look at I have an interview with a guy who's from a small uh, group of islands off the coast of Africa um, and on, uh, you know, this very same podcast. And, you know, what the French have done to his people is deplorable. So if criticizing Israel makes me anti-Israel, then I'm anti-France. I'm anti-Spain. I'm anti-the United States structurally. Uh, I'm anti Many countries. You know? I think the thing that sends people's flags up nowadays, though, is how many people are criticizing France, right, for their stuff. How many? And there's still terrible, systematic, all sorts of shit in all these countries. But I think also people come out against Israel doing this or that and not coming out against, I'm anti Bibi Netanyahu. I'm anti the Messianic Jews who he has in his coalition who think it is their mission to populate that entire land and get rid of the people there. You know, you know, it comes out as I'm anti this country because that's how it turns out in, in, in the public dialogue. It's, you know, Israel needs to blah, blah, blah. I mean, people say that about America, too. But, you know, it's Trump, really. Right. I mean, the way we might feel, you know, like these policies are terrible. And like, look, inside this country, we're trying to like we're trying to get rid of this guy. I mean, enough people in Israel, they feel that way, too. A lot of times like they are in this place where they cannot move forward because they have this. I mean, if we think we're gridlocked here with how the government works, uh, um, the way the parliamentary system works there is, yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, there's nothing good to say about it. <laughs> I mean, you know, Mark Lamont Hill, you know, uh, nearly lost his job. 
Um, luckily, he's a distinguished professor. I'm not. So, you know, uh, like I said, I might, hopefully I won't have to go to Josh for a job. But, um, but one of the things I know Josh does is that he hires people that, are, you know, need help. So if I do need that help, uh, <laughs> I know where to turn. But, uh, you know, he got upset for, or he got, you know, uh, excoriated for saying that, in part, for saying that we need to start looking in Israel for a one-state solution. Everyone says, you know, let's give the Palestinians some land, and then they can shut up. You know? No one ever says that in the United States about African Americans. Like, all right, we're going to give them Louisiana and, you know, Alabama and Florida, you know? No one ever says that. You know, there, there were black groups, the Republic of New Africa, who actually proposed that. But, you right. know, that's never taken to any kind of government. You know, nobody negotiates that. What would it look like to have full representation and integration of Palestinians into Israeli society? You know, and still maintain, you know, it as, you know, the Jewish state. You know, that's it's, what, I mean, it's was basically. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy hard. It's, you know, it's also people talk about and separate, you know, the Israelis doing this or that and, and, and the Palestinians wanting this or that. But when you actually dig down to the people who are there, like to the extent that we're being held hostage by the current president and, you know, gridlock and whatnot, you know, you have a government, you know, uh, a Palestinian government on one side because there's, you know, there's separate groups of, you know, people that claim, the Palestinians, I mean, like between, you know, the West Bank and 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 and, uh, and Gaza, you know, different places and different sorts of uh, governments. And I know at some points they're united and other points they're not. But you have a group, Hamas, that I know is very triggering for Israel because they have a doctrine of saying this state should not exist. And that's who is in charge in these parts. That still doesn't mean Israel needs to let up on trying to make the lives better of these people that are, they have their own humanitarian crisis that they've created right there. Like they need to fix that. It's right. difficult when the people who speak for those, speak for those people, you know, want you dead, but it's a, uh, um, it's a difficult question because there's a security issue and it's not, I mean, I wish we were, it's not easy. It's, no, uh, it's um, not. um, you know, and that's where and the, that's, the trauma, the inherited trauma comes into you. Like my father, you know, was also, I didn't grow up there. So he was probably there a few years before your dad, but he was born in Germany right at the end of World War II. Um, he, would, had, he was on a ship to Israel, the Exodus, in utero, you know, and it got turned around by the English and came, sent back to Germany. And he was born in Germany and grew up his, you know, I think about any problems I may have, like his world was, you know, and he, he's like pretty well adjusted, but he was born in a displaced person's camp and lived the first year of his life in a tent, you know? <laughs> Um, what, what an experience. Um, but this trauma of like, look, this is like, and he's, he, he was in the army in Israel. Uh, that's where he grew up. And, you know, there's this feeling that we clawed this land for ourselves because we were, I mean, the way, you know, like you want a real like Hitler quote, an actual one, like trying to exterminate them like rats, you know, like we carved this out to find a place. Um, and there is that inherited trauma that doesn't mean that you can turn around, I'm not saying do it to somebody else, but it doesn't mean that that puts you off the hook of these other people who are suffering. It doesn't, it doesn't take you off the hook for that. You still need to find a way to make that right. You still need to find a way to make that better. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, uh, and uh, to kind of pull it full circle, when we look at Palestinians, African Americans see them as an oppressed people by Ashkenazi Jews who, by all appearances, are white. Right. You see Palestinians, brown Palestinians, being oppressed by Ashkenazi Jews of European descent. And they're like, you know, instead of saying, you know, the Jews who started Israel, I think in some ways, you know, um, it's what you know, someone like Marcus Garvey and others like dreamed of, you know what right. I mean? It was for yeah. black people was that exact same thing. What was, 
you know, to take over your ancestral homeland and rule it for yourself. Um, but yet, I think what black people see, and I think in some ways rightly so, is they see an oppressed brown people by people who appear white and they're saying, my experience is analogous to theirs. There's certainly, I can tell you, um, you know, while I asked where's the Jewish George Floyd, I'm nearly certain there's probably a few Palestinian George Floyds. So I think that there is that kind of um, situation, you know, where that leads to that kind of anti-Israel uh, discussion. The problem, again, as I said, is that the focus is so much on that one part of the world. Right. You know what I mean? That's my, that's my only critique. I think critiquing the, the, the Israeli state for what they do and for making Jewish, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Palestinian George Floyds is perfectly valid. And there are people, um, American Jews, who will defend Israel at all costs. Like, and I, and I kind of get it, but not, we can be better. You know what I mean? Like, if, if the argument is we can be better, we are great, but we can be better, I, I, I love that argument. You know what I mean? Well, the problem is the, the, you know, and I'm saying too, with this country, like we're the greatest until the time comes time to be, be the greatest. Uh, right. My kids love that uh, um, uh, uh, Lizzo song. Like she's something like that. Like, yeah, yeah there's some line that they talk about being great until they got to be great, you know? Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but when it comes to being better, it often involves people that you see as the other, right? It often involves widening your tent and making lives better for other people. And it, you know, something I want to say, I wanted to turn it back to this country is, you know, in this country, because, you know, I pass for white, I have a different experience than people, you know, like the, the color of my skin gets me access to clubs that I don't mean actual clubs, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm way past that age, but uh, um, to clubs that other people don't have, because they look a certain way, and they're judged, you know, this way or that way, because of that. And because of that, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, this, you know, oppressive state, the systematic racism, you know, systematic holding people back is perpetrated by people of my faith the same way as it is a, a lot of other white people, you know. Um, and I think that is part of our mandate, you know, like, it's great. We need to be better. We need to, like, if we're going to say we're chosen, like, this is something, we need to see our complicity in parts of it and do things to change that. I know that doesn't pertain to this conversation exactly but um you know as far as banks go on redlining my people are right there on both sides of it right they were doing the redlining they were all you know like the, you know it's because you get access to you know to that club to be part of like the head of that bank to write that policy to you know and nobody questions it if you were an african-american person writing that policy like you know it would sit, but here's this white guy writing this policy and you know we don't think about the fact that oh he's jewish you know um, I think there's a, a lot of work in my own Jewish pride um, that we need to be better at, at a lot of stuff that, uh, um, you know, it's obviously uh, MLK, but, you know, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar just saying it again today about, you know, if uh, uh, I'm going to butcher it too. I'd even bring up a quote that I'm going to butcher. Um, but, uh, um, you know, none of us are free, you know, unless all of us are free, like just to sit there and enjoy this privilege and like use it to do something to somebody else. What is that? What kind of privilege is that? It's... Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, uh, what is it? Injustice everywhere, in, anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, we definitely have that responsibility to, you know, to actually uh, fix some of these things and not just be self-interested. And I think that some of, the frustration historically has also been, uh, you know, like the Jewish person who's writing that redlining policy. It's like, yo, you just got in that club. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and you're gonna you're gonna shit on me, bro? Like, you know. So I I think that there's 
there's a little bit of frustration there. And, you know, with the anti-Semitism that, that was in the air anyway, because the, you know, American white system has always educated all of our children. And when they educate our children, they educate, you know, particularly with black people, they educate our children to hate ourselves um, and also to hate some other people. Right. Um, and to deflect responsibility away from themselves. So what happens? The Korean store owner gets owned. The Jewish banker uh, gets, uh, gets criticized or, or blamed. The Jewish banker gets blamed rather than, you know, the white supremacist system that created that kind of hierarchy. And I think it is fair to say we can expect more of our Jewish brothers. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. And, and again, I hope that doesn't get me in trouble. But, you know, I would like to think that not only do African-Americans see their experience as analogous to that of Jews throughout history, Jews should see their experience. And this is the, the reason for the civil rights situation. The Jews during the civil rights movement saw their experience as analogous to African-Americans. Somehow it didn't translate in other parts. It was like, I got in, I can write this policy, I can make lots of money, and I'm not thinking about, you know, the human rights of, you know, some of the people in my community. But it wasn't, even, it, it wasn't even everybody who went along with that and helped out with that. There's certain people who feel that mandate to go and help. You know, it, it's just, again, going back to not being monolithic, like, you know, the right. coronavirus, the spacing. I, you know, my parents come by sometimes and they stand, you know, far away from the house and we stand out there with my kids and whatnot. And my dad loves to bring up, there's a Black Lives Matter sign in the front of our house. And we get into it every time about that because... All that, you know, like everybody, all lives matter, you know, that kind of shit, you know? And I'm like, you are a hundred percent right. But look at this house you're standing in in front of mine. And I'm having a very easy time raising my kids right now. Like right. I can focus on somebody else, not myself right now. Like there are a lot of people who are hurting so much more that like, it's just the, like all lives, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I, absolutely. Some people I mean, feel that mandate to be better and some people just don't. And I'm not saying just as Jews. I mean, it, in general, I think that goes across all. And that's where you get that. So like with people not being monolithic, you, you know, or I mean, groups of people not being, you know, monolithic in thought or practice. Um, because even like you said, in the civil rights movement, it wasn't Jews as a universal thing got up and, you know, marched. You know, it's the ones who felt that call, you know, Catholic priests who felt that call, you know, not all Catholics, you know, um, I mean, I think all of this, you know, right now, this moment, and I know it's going back to what, you know, was discussed before, but I think it's on all of us. Like there's momentum and, and to make things better. Like it's, what are we, what are we doing if we're not that? And I, I know it's, I understand, I understand it's hard. You know, like everybody's quarantined. Everybody's uh, dealing with these things right now. Like I'm having such anxiety issues now. Everybody's just hanging on by a thread, but right. what are we yeah, doing? I, and I, I think, you know, as far as, I just want to say really quick, as far as Nick Cannon, he did say, quote, I must apologize to my Jewish brothers and sisters for putting them in such a painful position, which was never my intention. But I know this whole situation has hurt many people and together we will make it right. So he did make a statement. He did apologize. Um, but I think, again, what feeds this idea that we have in a lot of African-American communities um, that Jews have this inordinate amount of power and are using it against people of color, whether they're Palestinian or in America, whether they're black, is the fact that Nick Cannon, you know, everything got stripped away overnight. You know what I mean? Like Viacom came through and said, all right, you're done. You know, uh, but at the same time, the people who killed Breonna Taylor, are still, you know, walking around, you know, going to restaurants, you know, I don't even know if they're wearing masks, they're doing whatever they want to do. Um, the people uh, who killed George Floyd are out on bail. You know what I mean? Uh, 
Um, and there's a very good chance that they're going to beat this case. You know, I, I, you know, everybody's saying, oh, you know, they're, they're going to go to prison forever. I'm not convinced. I mean, maybe they'll get Chauvin. Those other guys are going to walk. I, right. I believe. We'll oh. see. Um, I think you're going to see where uh, much of, you know, wh where I think a lot of African-Americans are like, when do we get this same kind of justice? You know, stuff was so swift over a comment. And if you listen to, to what Nick Cannon said, it was, all, it was a whole lot of like, you know, caucus mountains, you know, like allergic to the sun, you know, stuff like that you would hear in certain discussions that, I, you know, that, you know, I've been a part of some of those, you know, um, when I was a kid, you know, the kind of conspiracy kind of thing. And he was up there with Professor Griff, uh, who said some things in the, in the past that were, you know, this whole idea of Jews running the world and all of that. And reminded in the interview that he still stands by that. Yeah. Oh, did yeah. he? I didn't. Yeah. I didn't that part. Because he called, you know, and the canon mentions that you got called out for this and this way back when. And he says, like, you know, and that's uh, still true today. Or I still stand, whatever. Yeah, he says, somehow identifies with that again. Yeah, wow. You know, um, so I, I think that there is, like, a situation that, you know, uh, where people feel and again i'm just talking about feelings fat feelings are not facts that's something that a friend of mine reminded me when when another friend of mine passed away um she was like look feelings are not facts and you have to remember that and i th but i think a lot of people feel like you say something about jews you're done you know you can shoot an african-american or step on his neck or many do, you know, choke him to death. Or, you know, riddle his body with bullets. And there's no accountability. But say some words. You know what I mean? And I, and I want to say that this is not true, but I'm trying to be really careful. Because I'm scared shitless, to be honest, to be addressing this topic. But I think it's important. It's an important dialogue. But... If I said that that was a hundred, that I didn't feel that that's somewhat true, like that if I say the wrong thing here, you know, um, you know, there are people, black, white people who have said the N word, said, you know, other people who have said disparaging things about African Americans. Trump says something every other freaking week about. Steve King was still in Congress until however long, ago, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but if you say so, and, and you know, there there are people that I think were taken completely out of context, like Il, Ilhan Omar, I think it's taken out of context and called an anti-Semite, and I think it's a little, it's kind of unfair because, it's, as I said, I think some of what she said has been taken out of context, even if she was factually wrong, like, you know, there's some people did something, you know what I mean, thing, right. totally taken out of context. Oh, that, no, that's, yeah, I, that comment, I think, is ridiculous that people reacted to it the way they did. Yeah, I mean, it was just like, come on, you're just, you're literally just hovering over looking for something. But, again, words offend you more than bullets. More than choking a man till he can't breathe. And I think that's what frustrates a lot of people. So, uh, you know, I don't excuse what Nick Cannon said that still you can't say shit like that. Like, it's just not yeah. having said that there's no comparison between the plight of the African-American in this country and the Jew in this country. You're right, because these words get somebody canceled and you can shoot somebody and not. And yeah, no, I 100 percent agree with you on that. I don't you know, it's still you can't have people out there making those comments because words become dangerous after a while. But it's not this. You're right. It's not the same thing. It's not even a comparison. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, as as a matter of fact, some of these people get, you know, get uh, rewarded for their anti-blackness. You know, um, I've never, 
you know, you can say that Farrakhan has has hung around, and I will. I want to ask you one question though, actually, about Farrakhan, and that is, there are many people in black communities who argue that Farrakhan's political relevancy would be nil if it wasn't for the Jewish community reacting to every time he shows up. Now, I wanted to ask your response to that. Because on some level, I think honestly, black people since the Million Man March have not really been checking for Farrakhan who weren't in the nation and the nation is small. You know, right. the NY is a small organization. I barely, when I go to the hood, I barely see fairy, Final Call like I used to. Right, night, yeah. I see somebody selling Final Call everywhere. Um, you don't see that as much anymore. Um, he's been totally marginalized. He's got his, his Twitter verification has been taken away. It's the it's the the backlash that draws him into political relevancy. And I mean, I didn't even know he was still around, honestly. Not, not you know, until uh, um, was it Tamika Mallory, is that, um, you know, yeah. with, uh, you know, and then it comes up that, you know, and then she supports him and that, you know, so right, the backlash is, I, I mean, you're right. I mean, there's the relevance had sort of disappeared. And, and that's the thing is like, I feel like we've marginalized uh, you know, David Duke, with the exception of Trump kind of bringing him back to some level of relevancy. Right. Blacks and Jews together marginalized David Duke. You know, David Duke was a stone's throw from becoming governor. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, of the state yeah. of Louisiana. Literally. I mean, it was overwhelming you know, support from black communities that kept him. He got the majority of the white vote in the state of Louisiana, by far. Yeah. You know what I mean? That should tell you something about the United States within our lifetime. <laughs> like, and we weren't even young. We were old enough. As a matter of fact, when he was running during that race, I remember my dad sitting in a car with my dad and him saying basically that if David Duke becomes president, we're going to leave the country. You know what I mean? And again, my dad wasn't afraid of that because his parents left the country. So yeah. he was like, like, I, I remember thinking that I was like, man, you know, here I am, you know, I'm, I'm in school and all that. And I'm going to have to leave the country. Because, yeah. You know, yeah. this guy, could this guy actually become president? Um, and we, I think effectively have marginalized him to the point where, he is no longer that same political threat. Right. Uh, just Trump kind of took his place. Brought him back. Well, and brought him back too, right? Yeah. Brought him back. Um, Farrakhan, who I don't think could have ever been, he could maybe have run one of mayor's role in a lot of cities, but he definitely couldn't have been governor anywhere or been, you know, there was never a threat of him being president or anything like that. Well, one of the things about Farrakhan is that, you know, I don't think he would have that same political relevancy were it not for, you know, the people who are always talking about anti-Semitism and relating him to, you know, to being anti-Semitic. I think that's why Farrakhan doesn't fight the charge so much. I right. think he would, he would normally be like, I'm not an anti-Semite, you know, and talk this and that and the third. But I think he kind of is like, well, this is what keeps me in the game. I want to keep my name out there. Yeah. <laughs> and this is what, because of the backlash, it's the backlash against Farrakhan that creates the support for Farrakhan because they feel like white people, including Jewish people, are again, are ganging up on a black man and ignoring all of the ways in which black people are systematically oppressed and killed. Right. You know, which creates this kind of, you know, this situation that we're in right now. Um, I don't know, you know, where we go from here. You know, is it, so I guess my final question is like, do we just, 
continue to dialogue on these issues? How do we make it so that these communities, there's more brotherhood between these communities? And I think if American Jews and African Americans can get together and find some understanding on a whole host of issues, not everybody's going to agree, but if we can come together and find some commonality, find some common ground, um, that perhaps that could be something where, you know, okay, we can finally address the issues with Israel and, and you know, the state of Israel. Where, and not only that, but other places in the world that, that are, you know, that suffer oppression. But I, we could really model that for the world. Is there a way we can go about doing that? How do we do that? Is it just more discussions? Is it more dialogue? Or is that just more talk? Like, I would like to, to be involved in something that, that brought people together. I mean, it's easy to say it's, you know, more dialogue and, you know, but it's, you know, how many decades, you know, and how many centuries? Yeah, it's, it's easy to say that it's, um, you know, even what's going on in this country now on a, on a larger scale and how, like, we can't even agree to save each other's lives by putting a freaking mask on our face. You know, like, it's like this, you know, everybody's so, everybody thinks everybody's doing a little bit better than them, right? And so they're ready to fight about whatever because that person's doing a little bit better than I am. Not not, not just financially, just in general. Like, uh, uh, I, I need to make sure I'm protecting my own. Um, I wish it was something easy, easy as talking. I mean, I think talking definitely, you know, helps these things. And you know what? you know, as we can sit here, you know, and you say, like, you want to make sure you say the right thing and whatnot. And, you know, there's a time where you could sit there and say something that, like, oh, I don't agree with that's wrong, you know, that that's hurtful, you know, maybe not hurtful. But, you know, if we don't sit here and talk about these things, it's, it's like the stupid echo chambers we're all in on, online. Like, if we can't talk about these things, then yeah, well, why are we even trying? Yeah, no, I mean, we definitely need to need to talk more about it. I don't know that that's where the answer is. You know right. what I mean? Um, somehow, well, I guess, it, I guess it begins with talking and ends somewhere else. Um, but I feel like a lot of times when I think about like some of the guys we went to high school with who, are, who I think are good people, like they are completely dismissive of black issues. But militant and, you know, uh, really, sorry, I've been talking all day, so I'm losing words now. <laughs> um, I'm starting to lose it too. It's past my bedtime. <laughs> yeah. But, but they really uh, are adamant about Jewish issues and they will dismiss any kind of pushback or they get, you know, indignant about any kind of pushback. But you're saying mostly Jewish people who are like that. Right. Um, I, mean, I feel like most people are like that about their, you know, like they don't want to hear, you know, I mean, I don't feel that way, but I feel like a lot of people, you know, it's like the same way. Like I can, you know, like have the discussion with my parents and they're that way. And I'm not, you know, you know, it's a, uh, or just older generations too. It's not just older generation. I know you mentioned people we went to high school with. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, the, it's, you know, it's also the same person who will say all lives matter, right? Yeah. Like, why are you calling out the, why are you calling out this group? All lives matter. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm willing to hear anybody. Right. You know, like, I'm I'm willing to hear anybody. There are as long as I think you know. Since you quoted uh, James Baldwin earlier, and I'm going to butcher this, but you know, as long as you are not, as long as what you're saying is not rooted in dehumanizing me and dehumanizing people like me and dehumanizing anybody, I'm willing to have the conversation. Right. Um, I'm willing to talk about anything. You know, shoot, I go on Fox News, so y'all know. No. I'm willing, you know, I'm willing to discuss with almost anybody. You know what I mean? Um, you know, if if Tariq Nasheed or shoot Nick Cannon, Deshaun Jackson, anybody wants to come and discuss these things, I w I would love that. 
not just because maybe somebody else would watch my YouTube page. But beyond that, I think, you know, you know, I would love to have those discussions. I would love to have these discussions with, you know, some members of APAC or whatever, or, you know, hardcore Zionists. You know, I, I would totally be willing to have that conversation. I just, you know, hope that we aren't talking past one another and that it's not rooted in dehumanizing me in dehumanizing black people and even dehumanizing Jews or, or Muslims or Palestinians or, you know, the Uyghur people in China. As long as we're not dehumanizing people, I'm, I'm willing to take part in any discussion. Right. Yeah. But I know it's past your bedtime. I want to thank you once again for coming on the other Underground Railroad here. We're definitely going to have to have you back. I definitely want to continue this conversation. I want to have it again. And, um, you know, it was short notice, but I wanted to, you know, involve someone who is a black Jewish person next time. Um, because I think they would have a unique perspective sure. on some of these things, um, particularly on anti-blackness and in, in, uh, in Jewish communities and, you know, anti-Semitic sentiments in black communities. Right. Um, so I would love to discuss that. And, you know, the three of us can have that. Maybe we can, one of these days when things open up, we can do it, you know, with a, maybe with a live audience at All in one Hershey. place. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be cool. We should do something at Hershey's. I think it would be amazing. Yeah. We got, yeah. A lot of space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. All right, my man. Yo, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You yeah, know, thanks for having me. You know, and, and much love to your family. And I hope we can see each other one of these days soon. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my brother. Thanks for having me. All right. Be well. Yeah.